Welcome, 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 welcome to the Modern Medicine Movement. Woo! Let's go! All right! Welcome, welcome, guys. Dr. Thomas Hemingway here. Super pumped. Super grateful. Woo! Another day. Woo! All right. Just getting myself a little pumped up because we got some good stuff today guys oh my gosh we got got a little bit of fun are you guys ready for that how about how about a little applause yeah all right all right love that all right you guys are awake Woohoo! here we go all right so hey i'm so grateful for you guys you guys are just the reason i do this so pumped oh my gosh welcome to the modern medicine movement what an amazing movement we're making here. You know, we, we talked about changing the name of the podcast and you guys kind of voted against it. You wanted to keep the movement going, which I agree with. I love the movement. I think the movement is where it's at because we are on a mission to really educate the world how we can achieve optimal health through natural means, you know, not the traditional kind of definition of medicine, which is not necessarily traditional, but I think what has come into play in the last 50 years is medicine equates with pharmaceuticals, which is not the way it is. The father of medicine, guys, was, well, we usually give deference to Hippocrates, right? Hippocrates was, was one of the original physicians, and you know what he always said? He was all about the natural means. In fact, he said, all disease begins in the gut, like he was into gut Health, and you know what Dr. Hemingway says is all health begins in the gut. So we are on a mission to promote optimal health of the body, the mind, the soul, the spirit, the muscles, the emotions, the relationships, all the good stuff related to health. And we love to do so naturally through natural means because I think we're missing the boat oftentimes in Western medicine when we're just doing this proverbial band-aid approach, which... Um, you know, I, I understand it because I went to medical school and, you know, we took hours and hours and semesters and semesters of pharmacology. And, you know, in that course, in courses, we, did, we took multiple pharmacology courses. We learned all the drugs, right? All the therapeutics that were medicinal therapeutics from the pharmaceutical companies. What we didn't learn a whole lot about was all the natural means, which is a shame. In fact, I started my, my quest for all things natural health in medical school, actually prior to medical school with uh, the likes of, uh, you guys probably know the Ayurvedic stallion, Dr. Deepak Chopra, what an amazing dude. But I learned a lot of things from him in my teens. I read half a dozen of his books as a teenager. And that, you know, interestingly enough, that and the show ER, shout out to all you guys, George Clooney fans from back in the day when ER was like, the shiz, right? Every Thursday night, who was there? Were you guys there? I mean, what an amazing show that was, you know, between Thursday night ER episodes, you know, the Doogie Howsers, the, uh, I mean, the Deepak Chopra for me was the natural holistic health, which was really getting me going. I mean, I got fired up about that. My mom and I used to chat about that all the time. And, and then the sort of, I think just the uh, energy of the ER was what kind of you know, I love that combination. So I, as you know, went to medical school. You know, I cranked my four years of medical school. I did after my four years of college and biology and chemistry and all kinds of crazy sciences. And, and then, you know, four years of medical school. And then I did four years of residency where I did all the things, guys. I did rotations in all the major specialties. I loved OB. I loved pediatrics. I loved emergency care because I felt like we were really making a difference. And, you know, we do have in this country amazing emergency care. I became the, the George Clooney of the ER where I worked, right? <laughs> well, I'm a little bit unshaven here today, so maybe I could match that. But, um, you know, I worked 15 years in the ER. And, you know, in that process, I loved delivering that, e what we call acute care medicine, or in an emergency, in a situation where somebody's dying of a heart attack, or some kind of crazy overdose or a car wreck or trauma. Like I am master at all those things. And what I found that, that we were lacking, not only there in the hospital setting, but in the clinics, because I worked in clinics as well. I was a chief 
of the urgent care in my area, also chief of the ER for a decade. And what I, what I saw, because all of these patients were coming in to see me in either urgent care or ER, because their primary care services or their you know, regular docs were, were struggling in one way or another, they were lacking the ability to really help these people long-term. They were not doing a great job at preventing all of these you know, many and sundry medical conditions that ultimately take millions and millions of lives. In fact, in the U.S. alone, you guys may know this, but almost every 10 to 15 seconds, somebody dies of a preventable cause, literally a preventable cause every 10 to 15 seconds. Every 30 seconds, somebody dies of heart disease here in the U.S. And heart disease is almost entirely preventable. And after, you know, 15 years in the hospitals, clinics, ERs, I just... I mean, I saw a lot of people die of heart attacks. Heart attacks, super common. Cancer, you know, number one and two right there. Stroke, number three. Those top three causes of death, guys, are almost entirely preventable. And it just pained me. You know, I could help them in their emergency. I could set them up with, you know, a quick trip to the, what's called the cardiac cath lab. Or if we couldn't get them to the cath lab, we would do those amazing clot busting, you know, drugs called thrombolytics. You know, we could do that, kind of buy them some time but we really weren't moving the needle as far as preventing the disease in the first place. Heart disease, guys, is almost entirely preventable. And we in Western medicine as a whole, my physician colleagues out there, we're doing a crappy job at promoting natural health and wellness and preventing disease. We could do so much better. And so my mission, my ikigai, my passion is to deliver high quality, natural health information to you guys that's peer reviewed, that's evidence-based, that comes from data. It's not just me and my soapbox. Dr. Thomas is actually sharing the real deal literature with you guys, primarily about how we can prevent these disastrous diseases. They're devastating. They took the life of the grandfather of my little girls. Never really got to know my little girls. My my father-in-law died in his mid-60s of preventable causes. He died of complications of type 2 diabetes and stroke. And he wasn't really an obese, overweight dude. He just ate like garbage. And it just pains me to think he was like the skinny fat out there. He used to run like crazy. He he ran marathons. But you know what? It did not make up for his crappy diet. And it just pains me to even think that he couldn't, didn't really get the opportunity to get to know his granddaughters because he didn't pay attention to what was on the end of his fork. And I think a lot of us don't give enough credence to that. We think we can exercise our way out of a crappy diet. You know, my favorite shirt of all times that I love to make fun of is the classic one of the, of the raccoon, you know, and I'm, I'm holding weights here on the YouTube. If you're seeing me doing a deadlift (laughs) with like literally hundreds and hundreds of pounds and it says, I exercise, I work out, so I can eat garbage. Guys, that is not the way. <coughs> you can never exercise your way out of a crappy diet. You just can't do it. Exercise is critical. It's crucial. It's one of my favorite things to talk about. You guys know this. I just made a post this week about a recent study in the Journal of the American Medical Association, or JAMA, super well-known, well-respected, peer-reviewed Data which showed that over 1.4 million people were studied and the secret sauce to avoid over a dozen cancers was regular daily, basically, exercise or movement. Literally going for a walk for 15, 20 minutes a day was helping to prevent over a dozen cancers, which is phenomenal, guys. I love to get my movement. You see behind me, you see the beautiful Rocky Mountains, the Wasatch Front, if you will, And I love to spend time in the mountains hiking and climbing. And today I hiked up the ski slope because the end of the season is nigh upon us. Probably my last hike of the regular year. And I love to get my movement in. But guys, it will not ever, never, never, never take the place of a crappy diet. Just can't do it. It's not going to happen. Food, guys, is the very best and the very most frequent medicine. And we get to decide. It can be our very best medicine, or it can be a slow poison, and we get to decide what ends up on the end of that fork. So anyway, guys, I love you guys. Thanks for participating in the movement. I'm going to give a quick shout out to a couple of reviews that just came in. I just can't help but to thank you. 
Madam Bro um, wrote five stars and entitled it Life Changing. Thank you so much, Madam Bro. The Modern Medicine Movement podcast is a total game changer when it comes to health. Exclamation point. I absolutely love this podcast and recommend it to anyone who will listen. It has truly changed my life and my habits. Thank you, Dr. Hemingway. Oh my gosh. Love it, love it, love it. Another one entitled Love It by Jay Brock says, uh, Dr. Thomas does an amazing, amazing job with this podcast. Amazing job with the podcast. I indirectly work with him and his wife. I've been following them for years. They're amazing people. Dr. Thomas knows his stuff. As my family recently has started moving towards a more holistic approach to our lives, I love that I'm able to take advice from the person, from someone I know. I'm not very sciencey, but Dr. Thomas does a great job of breaking it down for even the simple-minded folks to understand. Love the podcast, Dr. Thomas. Keep it up. Thank you for the work that you do. Oh my gosh. Thank you, Jay Brox. You guys are the reason that I do this. I'm so grateful for you. Guys, if you haven't done it already, super easy to do. It helps the movement. helps get the word out. Please, 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 especially on Apple or Google or wherever you get your podcast, Spotify, whatever. Apple is probably the best to get the, the name out there. But scroll down to the bottom. You see the five stars. Click the one farthest to the right. And the little button down below to the left that looks like a square with a little pencil coming out the corner. Write a review. Please, please, please write me a review, guys. I love to share them right here live on YouTube, on the podcast, just to give you guys just kudos and thanks. I love you. Thank you because you are the reason I do this. And just to up-level this even more, guys, you probably know, but recently, oh my gosh, we just had an an inaugural, our first just kick butt (laughs) Zoom call for our new group, our Thrive VIP community. And it it is quite a community, guys. We are just up-leveling ourselves. We are just getting into it. There's so much content available. We're having Zoom calls together, weekly trainings in addition to the Zoom call that we do that's super, you know, in-depth, literally like masterclass stuff. We're doing that monthly in addition to weekly trainings. We're doing posts. We're doing challenges. We have a challenge every single week, guys. This week, if you want to get into it, The challenge is one of my favorites because it really moves the needle. It talks about everything food and the pantry, guys. The pantry purge is the challenge of the week. And I gave everybody a list of just super important things to take a look for in the pantry, things to eliminate, things to add, things to replace. Oh, my gosh. When I first did this a couple of years ago, guys, it was eye-opening. I mean, I literally tossed, well, most of it I donated because it hadn't expired. All the crap that expired, I just threw away. And that, that, that stuff that hadn't expired, I donated to the food pantry because a lot of people just don't have anything to eat. So I, But anyway, um, what's so crucial about that is there are so many things out there that are hiding in plain sight. Like you think they're quote-unquote healthy because you bought them at Trader Joe's or they say organic. Guys, you got to look a little deeper. Just because it says organic, if it says vegetable oil after that or canola oil after the word organic it's still crap it's still no good you gotta go for the stuff that's natural that's just pressed squeezed you know the things that we've been using for millennia like olive oil avocado oil coconut oil the stuff that you can get without high processing that's the stuff that you cook with you got to toss the rest and and i get into it in an in-depth training this week in our vip community so i hope you'll join me there Uh, Look in the show notes or go to my Instagram at Aloha Surf Doc. You can see the link there at the top, the link tree for VIP community for the Thrive. We are thriving, guys, not just surviving. And there's a great community there. We can help one another. You can ask me questions. I have office hours every week, weekly trainings every week, special master classes, Zoom classes. Oh my gosh, we just did one on everything food. It was incredible. You guys got to get in there. It's right now, it's literally at half price. It's $29.98 a month. And, oh my gosh, the content there is, I mean, most guys are charging 60 bucks a month or more for this. And frick, I'm a doctor for crying out loud. I got this stuff nailed and I'm studying it just on the daily and I'm sharing it with you. And I love, love, love having you. So if you're ready to up level and you're ready to get into it and you're ready to come with me on this journey where you'll get much more personalized attention, please, please, please sign up for the Thrive community. You will not be disappointed. Anyway, without further ado, the topic today actually was brought up by one of our Thrive community members. And so I wanted to give you guys a little teaser of what we talk about. Like literally, you can email me direct questions, message me, you're in a special group, and we chat. 
and we go live and Zoom and we get into it. And so one question came up this past week because we talked about all things food. And in all things food, you can't help but talk about the macros, right? The macronutrients. And it's so fun. There's so much information there. I can't get into all of it right now, but I'll give you a little a little pro- promo here that we have set up an entire masterclass on food. In fact, the entire month of May is going to be on proteins because proteins are so fascinating. We're going to talk all about the nitty gritty on proteins. What type of protein? Is it animal based, plant based? You know, what are the best? What's a complete protein? How much do you need? When should you take your protein? Is it once a day? Is it every couple of hours? Is it before you work out? Is it after you work out? We're going to get into it, get all the data out there. All about protein. Coming up real quick, guys, two weeks in May, we are getting into protein right now. We are kind of giving the intro to the whole macronutrients. We're talking a little bit about carbs, a little bit about fats, and a little bit about proteins. And then we're going to take them one by one in just full-on deep dive format. So proteins are coming up in May. Can't wait to share that with you. Please join me, the Thrive community. But one of the questions that came up when we were talking about all things foods was about the carbohydrates because a lot of people... And not, not their fault because there's so much misinformation about the carbohydrates. Tons of misinformation, right? We got the camps that are like anti-carb, you know, full-on keto, never a carb ever. I got to keep my millimoles of ketones up. And then there's those that are, you know, saying that they're coming from the College of Sports Medicine and you got to eat a whole bunch of carbs. In fact, I was just reading prior to the podcast today, the position statement from the International Society on Sports Nutrition, right? It was published in the Journal of the International Society of Sports Nutrition 2017. Super interesting article. Some of it is data-driven and some of it is just opinion. So it's it's a little, you know, it's a little interesting. You got to kind of kind of pick and choose the, the information and see where it's coming from because just because it comes from the International Society of Sports Nutrition you know, society, it's a position statement. What that means is it's an opinion statement of this international sports society of nutrition. And so there's a lot of good information in there. A lot of it's kind of questionable because there's not a lot of data behind some of it. Some of it's tradition, some of it's data driven. I'll share with you kind of my key takeaways here in a sec, but I found it to be pretty fascinating. Um, Kind of a lengthy article. It is available on PubMed and it's a free article. Everybody can read it, which is great. I'll put the link in the show notes, but it's got a lot of information out there that I found very fascinating. Like I said, some data driven, some not so much. Some is just opinion of the quote unquote experts. So, you know, you got to give give and take here. And and so what I wanted to focus on today is the stuff that is data driven, like carbohydrates, for better or for worse, are what we call non-essential. In other words, our body can actually make all the carbohydrates it needs. Did you know that our brain not only can survive off glucose, which we can make, it can get the glucose from our own liver. Our liver makes glucose every day. It's a process called gluconeogenesis. And it can make glucose no problem, even if you don't eat glucose. Isn't that crazy? It can make it from a number of things. It can make it from fat. It can make it from protein, amino acids. Like the body's pretty dope. It knows how to do this. That's how we can fast for 24 hours. 48 hours, 72 hours. Shoot, there's been people that have literally fasted. There's one guy, I I think he may hold the Guinness Book of World Records, 348 days, I think, of basically no calories, just hydration. But this guy, you know, I think he started at like eight or 900 pounds. So that's not, not for you and I to be fasting for a year, but literally it's been done by our species, right? For days or even several days or even weeks at a time without dying because our body knows how to produce not only the glucose that the brain needs, but also an alternate fuel called ketones. So I just say that because that's what the science is. That's what the data shows. The body can survive without carbohydrates. They're not essential. However, I'm not about surviving. You guys know me. For those of you that saw me at a line, the event in January, which was kick butt. I hope you guys got a chance to see the replay I just watched it actually this morning. I watched Mr. Dave Hollis, who was right before me. And then I watched my own because I was working. I'm, I work with a coach. And so we were kind of going through it. And he was giving me some feedback. And we kind of watched it together. It was super fun. And 
you know, I learned a few things about myself, about, you know, him, about his experience. You know, he's, he's a guy that's, he's older than I am. He's about, I don't know, uh, 10 or 15 years older than I am. He's been there, done that, coached a lot of people. So he's seen a lot of things, gave me some good input. But what I wanted to share with you was at that talk in Scottsdale, you guys can get it at alignevenslive.com. I talked about not just how to survive every day, right? Make it through the day, but how to thrive to have that energy, the vitality. <coughs> Sorry, I'm getting into it. I'm getting a dry throat here. But how to thrive in life. And for me, for me to thrive, I actually do need some carbs. <laughs> I found that out because I've tried full-on keto. I've tried them all. And although I'm a big proponent of healthy fats and I eat them daily. I love, love, love my avocados. You guys know that. Um, I also love, love, love some carbs like some natural fresh berries. Oh my gosh. Raspberries, strawberries, blueberries. I love kiwi. I love pomegranate. I love, I love bananas actually. A green banana. I know I'm a little weird. I like the fibery kind of, I don't know if you guys are familiar with the apple banana from Hawaii. Oh my gosh. That's like candy to me. I, I just love that stuff. And everybody's a little bit different. I truly believe that to thrive in life, we got to have all of the above. We got to have carbs. Of course, they got to be high quality carbs. We'll talk about what that means. We got to have fats, all those healthy fats that are out there, the healthy stuff that's in, oh my gosh, so many things, right? Nuts, the nut butters, the avocados, the sardines, the, my favorite, the ahi tuna, fresh wild caught sashimi. Oh my gosh, salmon, even the grass-fed and finished meat, the ribeye, I, I do all of the above, guys. I am a full-on rainbow, all of the rainbow. I do it all. Eat of the whole dang rainbow because there are literally hundreds of thousands of edible foods out there, and we're pretty pathetic. We're pathetic. I said it. Yeah, we are pathetic in the Western world. We literally eat 70% of our diet from four different plant species. Can you guys guess them? I'm sure you can. Wheat soy, corn, right? All the stuff that we just eat each and every day. Like it's literally crazy. And rice, like between those four things, that's almost 70% of our diet. And we're missing out on hundreds of thousands of amazing plant and animal species that are edible, that have all kinds of nutrients. Oh my gosh, guys, we are missing out. And so my mission is to get us to thrive through so much variety in our food. Food is medicine. It's the best ever. And variety is the spice of life. As it is with our food, as it is with our gut health, our bacteria that live in there, the more varied they are, the diversity of the gut, the more healthy we will be. So I get in all things food in our Thrive group. It's so awesome. But what one of them asked about is about the carbs because there's so much misinformation out there. Like, what the crap? Are we supposed to be keto? Are we not supposed to eat carbs? Are we supposed to eat them? What kind of carbs? And when? Like, guys, it matters. It's not just about what. What is really important. But the when is equally important. In other words, number one, I always preach this, is if it comes from God, the ground, nature, you know, the field, if it's natural, real food, right? You recognize it. You can see what it is. It doesn't have a label with 50 ingredients that's called something like impossible or beyond or who knows what, just this, just that. And it's got like 50 ingredients. Like why do we think as humans, we can better design a food than what comes from nature? Let me tell you, we can't. And when we try to, it's usually a pathetic failure. Like all of these concocted recipes from the lab, from the factory that literally have dozens and dozens and dozens and dozens of ingredients are full of a lot of super unhealthy ones. Yeah, spoiler alert. Just because it says plant-based, you got to read the label. There might be 50 things in there and half of them might be crap. There might be chemicals you don't even know how to pronounce. Most likely they have the seed oil, soybean oil, canola oil, grapeseed, rapeseed, sunflower oil, corn oil, vegetable oil, rice bran oil, all of this crap that's highly processed. There's so much of it out there. It's almost ubiquitous in processed food. It comes in a bag or in a box. 
or with a barcode be suspect. So number one, always I focus on is the quality of our food. Natural, from the ground, from the earth, from Mother Nature, from God, however you want to put it, that's top priority. The quality of our foods is first and foremost, 100% of the time. That goes for the carbs, that goes for the fats, that goes for the proteins, all of the above. Quality first trumps everything else, okay? And remember, what we eat is not only what matters. It's what they have eaten. So what my grandmother always said, right? She always taught me this. You are what you eat. It's critical. It's important. It is true. But you are also what you have eaten has eaten. So if you're eating, you know, the $152 a pound chicken that's been grazing on canola oil and grains and all kinds of not species appropriate things that it doesn't normally eat, that chicken is not going to be nearly as healthful as a pasture raise, run around, eat the eat the weeds, eat the <clears throat> little bugs that are out there. In Hawaii, we watch them eat the little cockroaches and stuff. Like if they're running around grazing, whether it be poultry, whether it be meat, you know, cows, whatever, grass-fed, finished buffalo, bison, you name it, even the fish, they should be wild. They should be doing their thing. They shouldn't be fed garbage like should be wild caught. They should be coming from their natural environment, eating their natural foods. And this comes from, also goes for plants. Plants should also be kind of in the wild state, right? The more wild they are, the more nutrients they are. If they're genetically modified or sprayed with pesticides or in other crappy soils or what have you, with lots of chemicals and artificial fertilizers and things, rather than just good old fashioned, you know, poop manure from the Animals that are running around out there, the chickens are grazing, the, the cows are grazing, they're pooping in the soil. Like, that's the best quality stuff for, for crap to grow in because it is regenerative. Did you know that regenerative soil is actually almost the antithesis of what, you know, most of the people out there will tell you? They'll say, oh my gosh, you can't eat animal foods because you're just increasing your carbon footprint. Well, that's true if you buy the feedlot animals, right? The ones that are confined in those confined feeding operations and they're fed dirt and they're fed, well, not dirt, but they're fed garbage, you know, sprinkles, seed oils, whatever. They're fattened up with grains. That's not the species appropriate diet. If you're letting the cows run around in the field and they're grazing on the plants, not only are the cows healthier, but that meat is way healthier for you. And the carbon is not only carbon neutral, it's actually better than carbon neutral. That carbon is sequestered or trapped into the soil when you farm that way. It's called regenerative agriculture. It's actually putting carbon back in to the soil as opposed to increasing greenhouse gases. So it can be done, but you got to look on the label. You got to buy grass fed, grass finished. You got to just say no to the confined feeding operations, the CAFOs. You got to vote with your wallet. And if we all do that, the quality of our food will go through the roof. And the big foods out there, the five companies that own all the big farms, they're going to have to change. If we just refuse to buy the crap that they're selling and we will only buy grass-fed and finish or organic, et cetera, et cetera, the high-quality stuff, they will have to change. So we got to be a part of this movement, guys, to increase not only the diversity of what we eat, but the quality. And so this is what I said to my group is that, look, with the carbs, carbs are neutral. They're not bad. They're not good. They're not evil. They're not, you know, it's not like that. I, For me, and for everybody, it's a little bit different. Every person has a slightly different tweak on what's best for them. How many carbs should they eat? How many fats? How many proteins? The macronutrients, it's, it's dependent upon you. There's no one size fits all, which is what I love because we all thrive a little bit differently. And our diet should all be a little bit different. That's why I don't prescribe to any diet plan. I, I, ugh, diet's like a swear word for me. D-I-E-T. It's a four-letter word. I hate it. And it has the word die in it. Like, don't diet. <laughs> don't do any kind of fad diet because the only thing that it will predict in the long term is future weight gain. How do I know that? Because that's what the science showed. If I look at my own family, I have several members that have been continuously on diets their whole lives, off and on, yo-yoing, and it's just, it pains me because what typically happens is all that weight comes back plus some, and that's what the data shows too. So I'm not about any kind of diet. I don't support any kind of diet. I'm about eating for you individualized 
what is the best for you. So for me, I eat carbs, I eat fats, and I eat protein. I eat all three and I mix it up. But when I eat my carbs, I'm having a couple of rules about it. I'm smart about it. I use the data. I use the science because carbs, one of the biggest problems in our current society today is that it's not just carbs. It's the highly processed carbs that come with a box bag or barcode that are destroying us. They are causing us to be so sick, so obese, so much heart disease, so much insulin resistance because we're eating the crappy stuff. We're eating the stuff that's packaged and highly processed, ultra refining the grains and, and flours, etc. If you eat the carbs that come from the vine, come from the ground, that are actually real food, you're not going to have that issue. And so real food trumps everything. And then the timing. So here's the deal. With carbs, get down into it. I don't recommend rolling out of bed and eating carbs. Like the so-called standard American diet, there's a reason why I call it the sad diet. Like what's breakfast composed of in the sad diet? Well, it's a bagel, it's a croissant, it's a bowl of Wheaties or some kind of breakfast cereal or what have you. And a piece of toast or whatever. Like all of these carbs, most of them are ultra highly processed and they're crap. Super difficult to find any one of those things that's super healthy. Go out and you try to find a super healthy breakfast cereal. Show me. I'd love to see it because there just aren't that many out there. Or a super healthy slice of bread. Super hard to find. Yes, you can buy you know natural organic sprouted bread or sourdough from Starter. You know I'm going to Europe next week and you better believe it. I'm having some sourdough from Starter with my meal. But guess what? I'm not going to eat it first thing in the morning. And... I'm not going to eat it at the beginning of my meal. I'm going to wait, and I'll tell you why. So carbs in the morning are a bad idea. We should start our day with protein, high quality, you know, prioritize that protein and high quality fats in the morning. If you're going to have any carbs at all, eat them in the morning at the very end of your meal. Super important, super critical, and it's super simple. So no carbs first thing in the morning, right? Try to stack your breakfast with high quality fat and protein. And when you do, you'll find a couple of things happen. One, you'll be much more satisfied and satiated. You're not going to be hungry two hours later. There's a reason now we have a new word in our vernacular that didn't exist when I was a kid. That word called hangry. The reason that never existed is because we used to eat more real food. Like when I was a kid, we didn't have snack food. There was no such thing. Like we ate in the morning, my mom cooked some eggs or whatever. We ate at lunch. It was usually, for me, it was like a tuna sandwich just because, I don't know, we just like tuna or whatever. Maybe it was cheap. I don't know. My mom thought it was nutritious, so I'd have that and an apple every day in my lunch. Then she'd cook some kind of home-cooked meal, and then we were done. Five o'clock, you know, by six, no food until the next morning. So seven o'clock. So we had a 13-hour circadian fast every single night. We didn't have a pantry where we could dig some kind of snack food out if we woke up hungry. In fact, I never did wake up hungry because... I didn't load myself up with a bunch of highly processed foods, which literally will make you wake up from sleep, you know, two, three hours later, feeling hungry. The reason they do that is because when you eat these highly processed foods, they cause a big spike in glucose, followed by a spike in insulin. And so what insulin does, it tries to get that glucose out of the bloodstream as quickly as possible because glucose in high levels is bad for your blood, for your body. It sticks to everything. It sticks to the stuff it's not supposed to stick to. It sticks to the arteries. It sticks to the kidneys. It sticks to the blood cells. It makes everything sticky. You've heard of glycation. When things get glycated, we get sick. We get inflamed. We get joint problems. We get heart problems. We get kidney problems. All kinds of problems when we have that glycation process, which comes from too much sugar. And so the insulin goes up. Then we have too much insulin. And then we get insulin resistant. And usually when you have that spike of insulin, it overshoots a little bit the sugar. And so maybe an hour, hour and a half later, what have you, you have a bottoming out, an actual low, a hypoglycemia when you eat a highly processed diet. And literally that hypoglycemia, that blood sugar dipping can wake you up from sleep. Like, have you ever had a, I don't know, highly processed meal, a restaurant meal, whatever, and then you're like, ate a pretty big meal, and then you woke up in the middle of the night and you were hungry? You're like, what the... How's that possible? I ate a big meal. Well, maybe it was a Olive Garden. Like, you know, I'll take the family there for a birthday or something. And they have all those rolls, which I'm sure are super highly processed, not good for you. And, you know, you eat a bunch of those. And 
whatever, a bunch of pasta. And, and like literally you can wake up in the middle of the night hungry because of that dip in your blood sugar caused by the highly processed food. So number one, don't eat carbs in the morning or at least not first thing. You can eat them at the end of your meal. So what I do is I eat a couple of eggs, have some avocado, throw some cheese on there, eat like a bowl. Like uh, I call it a, <laughs> it's pretty funny. I call it a souffle. I don't know why, but I just throw everything in it. All the veggies I can find, eggs, usually three or four of them, cheese, a whole avocado, like legit a full, both halves, avocado, salt, pepper, maybe a paprika, depending on how I'm feeling, a little bit of spice. I eat the whole bowl and then I kind of tease myself with a little slight dessert and I have a handful of berries as my dessert. So I eat my carbs at the end of my meal, but it's not the staple, especially not for breakfast, okay? And typically not so much the staple for lunch either. If I'm going to eat a bunch of carbs, usually it's at dinner. And that's, interestingly enough, that's actually been shown to be the best time to eat them, but high quality carbs, that is. You know, if you want to load up for a great workout the next day, a bunch of carbs and protein, high quality protein at night, actually that was one cool thing I did read in that International Society of Sports Nutrition, which has been shown by the data. Eat a bunch of protein at night. Like literally, it's helping your body regenerate, grow, you know, the muscle, what have you, get ready for the next day. And so I get up, energize, and I work out, typically fasted. I don't usually eat breakfast when I first roll out of bed. I wait a couple of hours and I'm working out, pumping it up. You know, I just bought a bunch of weights here at the house. We've got <laughs> I'm like tripping over them. There's weights everywhere. There's weights at my desk. There's weights in the kitchen. There's weights on the floor in the living room. Like it's probably a little bit overkill, but I love it because I just pick them up whenever I want and I do some weights. I do some resistance training and it's amazing. Like, so I eat primarily my carbs at night, but here's the deal. If I'm going to eat, say like a nice sourdough, sourdough roll from start or whatever, I don't eat it first. I start my meal with a full glass of water for two reasons. One, it actually increases metabolism. I talked about that previously on a podcast. Water will actually jumpstart your metabolism. Then I eat my appetizer, which is usually some kind of like amazing Brussels sprouts, asparagus, maybe a salad, whatever, a bunch of you know green fibrous stuff because that's the best way to start your meal because not only is that healthy for you, it's healthy for your gut, your gut health, your microbes of the gut, but also it will sort of diminish that spike in your blood sugar with the meal. If you eat your carbohydrates with quote unquote, somebody, I, I can't remember who, somebody said this and I kind of like the, the phraseology, if you will. If you eat your carbohydrates with clothes on them, you don't eat them naked, right? You don't eat that naked piece of bread at the beginning of your meal with nothing on it or whatever. You eat it during the meal with the meal or maybe you slather some grass-fed butter on it. Or for me, like, I don't eat toast often, but when I do, I like go overboard probably. <laughs> I just take one piece of bread, one piece of sprouted, usually it's sprouted grains bread um, or it's sourdough, and I'll slather it with some grass-fed butter, and then I'll put an entire, well, I'll probably do half. An entire one's kind of hard, but I do at least a full half of an avocado on top. So I'm dressing it. I'm putting clothes on those carbs, not eating it naked. Now, somebody mentioned something about naked carbs and I don't eat them naked and I, I don't eat them while I'm naked either. I have clothes on. I'm eating my, eating my food and I dress it up with healthy fat, with healthy protein. And when you do that, you're going to blunt the spike of your blood sugar because you got to go back to my previous podcast where I talked all about insulin. We talked about it with Dr. Bickman, an amazing podcast we had, where every time you eat these highly processed carbs, and especially if you eat them naked without other stuff, you are spiking the glucose, which spikes the insulin, which makes you sicker and sicker and sicker. It, it just boosts your inflammation. And now it's really cool. There's a lot of people out there studying this in great detail. You guys have heard of the blood sugar continuous uh, blood sugar monitors that you can get from programs like Levels, and there's several others out there. Um, super interesting data. There's actually millions and millions of data points now where you can look at you know, somebody that's of your age, your weight, your ethnicity, and, and how certain foods, and get an idea of how that might be for you. I personally, I'm, I'm hoping for one of these guys to just send me one so I can try it for a month because I'd love to see how it works out with me personally so I can get the real data. I know what, generally speaking, the data show, and they show that eating carbohydrates naked is not so much a great idea. It will literally spike that blood sugar and then spike the uh, insulin, which will inflame you, make you achy, 
make you more sick, and in the long term, put you at greater risk of heart disease, cancer, stroke, type 2 diabetes, all of this from insulin resistance. So go back, re-listen to that show with Dr. Bickman, the one after it. I've done a couple on, on that exact topic, insulin resistance, a couple on inflammation, and a lot of it rests in eating the carbohydrates, especially the highly processed ones that aren't awesome, that aren't good quality, but eating them naked. Bad idea. So next time you go out to eat, get a nice big green thing in the beginning, whether it's asparagus, Brussels sprouts, salad, whatever, and then eat the bread with a meal, slather a bunch of butter on it. If there's avocado to boot, you know, whatever, dip it in your uh, sauce or whatever, as long as it's healthy, right? (laughs) Do your best, but that will make a world of difference. So don't eat the carbs naked. Eat them later in the meal and eat them with other healthy fats and proteins. And that just may be the game changer for you. The timing is so critical because as I mentioned, you don't want to wake up first thing in the morning and literally start grinding, you know, the bowl of cereal, whatever, because those are simple, simple, highly processed carbs. And they're going to, you know, they have a high glycemic index. I talk all about that in previous podcasts, but what that means is they'll shoot that blood sugar up. Not a good idea. And then not only do they cause inflammation, but they also make you hungry, you know, an hour two hours later and you get hangry and you get ornery and you get, you know, I used to be like that because I was, I literally ate Wheaties like all the time. I thought they were supposed to be healthy. Like, holy crap, they put the Olympics gold medalists. They got to be healthy, right? (laughs) Wrong. In fact, uh, you want to hear the whole history on breakfast cereals, you got to listen to my podcast on the history behind the breakfast cereal with uh, J. Harvey Kellogg and oh my gosh, it's, and the CW Post. It's amazing. Now you can't make this stuff up, but it's, it's crazy, the history. Anyway, you don't want to be eating these carbs to start the day. You don't want to be eating the simple carbs. You want to have the higher, uh, excuse me, the higher fiber content, but the lower glycemic index ones, which are basically the real food ones, right? In Dr. Bickman's podcast, we we talked about don't drink your juice, or, or I should say don't drink your fruit, but eat your fruit, right? Don't do all the juicing because that basically makes it a much higher glycemic index and your blood sugar is going to boost so much higher. If you eat the whole fruit, it's so much better for you. In fact, I actually stopped eating, or, or I should say buying and drinking juice. I, I don't really buy any juice other than a very occasional, I buy some pomegranate because that has some health effects. Um, but I almost buy zero juice and I don't go to Jamba Juice anymore. I used to years ago thinking it was healthy. Holy like sugar load, Batman, like a thousand calories of high glycemic sugar boosting, you know, get you feel energized for an hour and then you feel like total dirt afterwards. So Oh my gosh, guys, <laughs> you got to eat your fruit. Do not drink your fruit, okay? So super, super interesting stuff. Um, what was interesting too, there's a study I wanted to share with you um, about um, carbs and the timing of the carbs. And so what was interesting is that they had a couple of groups of people. It wasn't a huge study, but it went on for six months, which was pretty cool. And this was reported in the journal, I'm going to just give you, um, it's actually called the Journal of Obesity. And what they found is when you have carbs at every single meal, these were, these were people who already had a little bit of a weight issue, but when they were, they actually had the similar amount of, of calories, but they had two groups. One had carbs at every meal. The other had carbs primarily at dinner, right? The dinner thing. See, I didn't make this stuff up. This is science. So what was interesting is those that ate the carbs mostly at dinner and not so much at the other meals, actually lost weight. They lost more weight. They lost more fat. Their, guess what? Their insulin was better. Their hormones were better. And they didn't feel so dang hungry all the time. Like, this is science. I'm not making this stuff up. It's not awesome to be loading up on carbs every two to three hours. Like, I was taught in medical school by my registered dietitian teachers and you know, those that so supposedly specialize in this, they, they were teaching us the wrong stuff. When you're spiking your blood sugar all the time, it's not good. It's bad for inflammation. It's bad for your health. And it just makes you hungry all the time, makes you hangry. So these guys that had primarily the carbs at dinner, they were basically improving on every of their parameters compared to those that ate carbs at all the meals. And so it was super, super interesting I'll put a link to it in the show notes. Their inflammation decreased. They were also more satisfied. They weren't feeling hungry all day long because they weren't loading up on carbs. They were eating healthier calories. They had the same amount of calories as the other guys, but 
they were at different times. They ate their carbs primarily at dinner. The others could eat them any time during the day. So it was super interesting, reported in the journal Obesity, six-month study. You just can't make this stuff up. This is, this is real science. So love, love, love that. Also, um, what's interesting um, is that it's, it's two things, right? It's timing, super critical. We've just been focusing on the last 15 minutes on the timing. Don't start your meal with the carbs. Eat them later in the meal. Don't eat them naked, right? Dress them up. Eat stuff with it. Like I talked about, if you're going to have that piece of toast, do like I do. Put some grass-fed butter, ghee, whatever on it, and then a whole half of an avocado with it, right? Or if you like the nut butters, put some nut butters on it or what have you. So <clears throat> it's fine to eat carbs if they agree with you. Number one, you got to eat the diet that works best for you. And if they're real food, right? They come from the ground or God or the earth or what have you. They're real food. Those are the kind of gar- carbs that I'm into, right? The hunter-gatherer cr- tribes, they eat the carbs out of the ground, the yucca, the, you know, in, in Hawaii, they eat the taro. Like, that's fine. That comes from the earth. But when you highly process them and just make them into these pulverized flowers that don't even resemble what they started out as, do you guys remember? Well, you know, we don't remember. But, you know, back in the day, thousands and thousands of years ago, there's basically no such thing as a gluten problem. But the reason for that is because the wheat that we use now is like it's not even almost the same species as what i mean it's like so different than the wheat that they used thousands and millennia ago right because now we pulverize it and we reduce it to this super fine fine flour which increases the surface area increases the area for the sugar to bond and it's 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 nutty like the glycemic index of our wheat and and things now um compared to what it was way back when it's just literally orders of magnitude different. I mean, the glycemic index of a piece of white bread, like it's, I forget the numbers, like 80 or something. It's close to, I mean, it's super high. It's crazy. It's like pure sugar, eating pure sugar. (laughs) Same with those breakfast cereals, same kind of thing. So it's, you got to pay attention to number one, like I say, always, 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 the quality is first and foremost. And then you can kind of get it nuanced out and focus on, the timing, because there's lots of cool issues. And, and I think we've gone on long enough on this podcast. I'm going to go into deeper. We're, we're, we go into the deep dives, guys, in our Thrive community, and you guys can ask me questions specifically. So I hope that you'll get into that community. We have so much value there, so much better access to me. And I'll, I'll get more into this topic. We have a couple of discussions coming up on carbohydrates. We will talk all about what we just shared right now, but go even deeper. We'll talk about specifics, even more so on the timing, but it does matter. Remember, please focus, number one, on the quality of your food and then the timing. It's so critical, so important. Can I get a, I was going to say, have up some applause. Let's see if you guys can give some applause out there. Yeah, the timing and quality is everything. I just can't tell you how important that is. And so I just, I just want you guys to know that this is what gets me going. I love to love to share this stuff with you because it matters. What ends up in our cart or our basket at the grocery store, and then ultimately what ends up on our fork, like that's first and foremost, guys. Food is the absolute best medicine, or it could be a poison if we're picking the wrong stuff. So remember, we got to pay attention. I hope you'll join me this week. Thrive Community with Dr. Thomas. Check out the links in the show notes. Check out the links on my Instagram at Aloha Surf Doc or at Modern Medicine Movement because this week, guys, is super exciting. We get into the details, the nitty-gritty on what to look for on that stuff you want to toss from your pantry, what stuff you want to put into your pantry, what you want to get rid of, and one thing at a time. You don't have to toss everything this week, but you'll at least get all the education you need about looking at ingredients labels. It can be a doozy. Like, who knew that they could call sugar by 20 different names? Like agave syrup, ah, avoid it like the plague, right? There's so much garbage out there. You got to stick to real. You got to stick to natural. Whole foods without the box, the bag, or the barcode, you guys are going to be thriving. So can't wait to see you in the community. Have a great week. I may miss the next one. We'll see how things go. I'm going to be in Europe uh, for the next week. So we'll see if we can get a show out to you. Hopefully we still can. But love you guys. We may be without the little bit of the applause and the the sounds and the music and all that, but I may still get one out to you. Um, I just love to do this because you guys are my why. So have a great week. A big aloha.